Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. So the old tale goes, much feared Peggy had for years managed to successfully stay one step ahead of the many witch-hunting gangs that roamed the countryside and who were determined to see all of England's witches roasted to death on flaming bonfires. Whether due to good luck or the effects of some dark and disturbing incantation, Peggy was clearly not meant to have a fiery end. She successfully went from hamlet to hamlet, from town to town, and carefully ensured that she never, ever stayed in one place for too long. And that included Warrington, England, which she chose to call her next home. After skillfully eluding hunters from the eastern England city of Norwich, although the witch hunters failed to catch up with Peggy, her reputation most assuredly preceded her, to the effect that when word got out that she was on the way, a chilled, an ominous atmosphere quickly descended upon Warrington and its worried people. It was an atmosphere which remained for months to the regret of just about everyone. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Many towns have tales of an old woman who might be a witch of some kind. Warrington, England had its own local evil crone. She was known as Old Peggy Gronich and was described as being evil, ugly, and haggard. But was she truly a witch? Many people thought so. Succubi are female-appearing sexual demons that approach men in a variety of ways, usually while they are sleeping, and then seduce them. Often, men report that their experiences with succubi are positive and enjoyable, but just as often, they report that the pleasure had a thread of something evil running through it, and that thread leads to utter destruction. And the woman you're living with right now, your own wife or girlfriend, is it possible she is a succubus? We'll look a bit deeper into the signs of a succubus so you can be aware and on alert. But first, in recent years, stories of personal encounters with shadow people have flooded the internet, so much so that a subcategory of Reddit was created solely for those who've experienced a shadow person and wish to share their story. We'll share some of those reports. Now, bolt your doors lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Many religions, legends, and folklore tell of shadow people in one form or another. Recently, the number of reports has exploded for some reason. A subcategory on Reddit reveals some of the spookiest true encounters with shadow people. These encounters may have you taking a second glance at every odd shadow you see. During the late 1960s, Redditor Sniggity encountered shadow people on three separate occasions the first time they caught one looking through their bedroom window before disappearing. The second was a few months later when they woke to five shadow people lurking aimlessly around their bedroom. The third and final time was late at a summer camp. They were laying in bed in their bungalow when shadowy figures appeared and began walking in circles around their bed. 
In all three occasions, the figures were pitch black, darker than the dimly lit room. This user has experienced all they want from shadow people and hopes to never encounter one again. Redditor Anathium has had a few encounters with shadow people, but there's only one that truly terrified them. On a summer evening, they stayed up late watching television with their sister. As they got up to go to bed, they passed by the front door and saw a Native American man standing in the frame. He stood at about six foot five, wore a black suit with an old-fashioned top hat, and had long hair and sharp blue eyes. The user screamed, making their sister jump up and impulsively throw a salt shaker at the figure. The shadow person's face fell into what seemed like a sorrowful expression, then shimmered away through the front door. Later, when describing the experience to their father, he said the shadow person sounded like a description of his great uncle, who died when he was young. When Redditor Isify was five or six, they went into their backyard to play on their trampoline and saw three men. They were standing side by side, wearing matching hats, and were all pitch black. They yelled at these creepy figures to get off the trampoline. Their parents heard the shouts and raced downstairs. To this day, the parents recall how frightened their child was. Isify told their parents that there were people on the trampoline, but when they looked back, the shadow people had vanished. They didn't step on the trampoline for two years after this, but that's not the end. Their grandma described waking to a dark figure standing above her many times at their old house. One night, their mother woke and saw a similar figure standing over their dad. They have moved houses since, but the shadow people seem to have followed them. After a poor night of sleep, Redditor Lossful Codex laid down midday to take a nap. They recall a strange feeling in their head, but believed it to be a side effect of sleep deprivation. Then, from the corner of their room, they heard South Park as if there was a television sitting right beside their bed, although there isn't. A ringing and high-pitched whooshing sound joined in the chorus. No matter how hard they tried, they couldn't lift their arms or head. Then they heard a knock at the window. Behind the glass pane crouched a dark, faceless figure. A second figure of identical stature entered through the bedroom door and sat at the edge of the bed. The shadow person spoke, I would be afraid too. This is what nightmares are made from. Lossful Codex was confident that it was a dream, but it seemed inescapable. The room faded in and out. Then the user woke. It was easily the scariest experience they'd ever had with lucid dreaming, assuming it was a dream. Redditor MacWeirdo42's earliest memory involves a shadow person. They were two or three years old at the time and recall waking to see a dark shadow on the wall beside their crib, a shadow with bright white eyes. It started moving towards them. They moved to the other side of the crib, but another shadow person was approaching from that side as well. Neither creature had any form that could easily be discerned. They were just pitch black against an already shadowed wall. With nowhere to go, the Redditor crouched in the center of their crib. Their parents recall MacWeirdo42 telling them that the shadows were trying to get them. At 3 a.m. one morning, Redditor Vox Xenu woke and went to the kitchen to get some water. On their way, they stumbled upon a shadow person sitting in the recliner in the family room. He'd been seeing shadow people all of his life, so this sudden appearance was not startling. He stood still for a couple of minutes to be certain it was indeed a shadow person. As his eyes adjusted to the dark, it became clearer a shadow person was sitting in their living room, staring at him. He started moving towards it. The figure seemed undaunted. When they were about three feet apart, the shadow person simply evaporated. In sixth grade, Redditor So Says Clucifer attended a barbecue at a local park. After a day of playing with her classmates, it was time to head home. The older kids, including this Reddit user, were tasking with collecting the younger kids and getting them ready to leave. The park wasn't that big, so finding all the kids proved easy. 
But then things took a turn toward the paranormal. About halfway across the park, they saw a dark figure of what appeared to be a toddling small child. Thinking it was one of the kids they were looking for, she and their friends ran after the shadow, yelling at it stop. When the figure reached the edge of the park, it turned white, dropped to all fours, ran up the tree like a cat, and leapt over the wall. The user and her friend ran away terrified, unsure of exactly what they saw. One night, Redditor Mr. Tibbles32 was five and trying to fall asleep. A shadow person appeared before his window. It seemed harmless, pacing back and forth in front of the window, appearing as if someone was floating just outside the window, but the room was on the second floor, 20 feet off the ground. No living human could be outside their window, and this continued to happen. Sometimes more than one would appear and the two shadow people would interact. The user didn't realize what they were seeing at the time, they just believed it to be a childish fantasy, like perhaps Peter Pan. It was only recently that he's been able to pinpoint exactly what he saw, and it was no lost boy. Redditor PineWolf14 has encountered shadow people more than once. Often, she would hear them breathing or feel the shadow hovering over her while she slept. She has heard whispers saying, don't move, in the middle of the night. Wisely, she never did, but on one night that changed. Instead of lying still, she rolled over and came face to face with a shadow person. If the two had been any closer, their foreheads would have been touching. She opened her mouth to scream, but there were hands around her throat, choking her. She started to thrash around, punching and kicking at the shadow person. Suddenly, the shadow person vanished. A few years ago, Redditor Mistress of Dark was sleeping over at a friend's house and had trouble sleeping. As they were lying awake, a tall, solid black silhouette entered the bedroom. It wore a top hat and a long coat and looked like a male figure. He sat in a chair beside the bed and stared at her. After a few seconds, he began talking. She doesn't remember the conversation exactly as the experience took place five years ago, but it was a harmless encounter and the shadow person seemed genuinely interested in her. Then a second shadow person appeared, the same black silhouette, but this time a woman. Strangely, she was crawling. The man sitting in the chair told them not to look and the woman wouldn't notice them. She was not a good entity. Shortly after, the woman left, and at dawn, the shadow man too vanished. When Weird Darkness returns, is it possible that the woman you're living with right now is a succubus, a female sex demon? We'll find out. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. 
And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. The succubus, a female sexual demon, is a paranormal entity with a history that dates back thousands of years. Every culture seems to possess some type of succubus myth. Succubi approach men in a variety of ways, usually while they are sleeping, then seduce them. Often men report that their experiences with succubi are positive and enjoyable, but just as often they report the pleasure had a thread of something evil running through it. According to succubus legends, sometimes these men come to bad ends after associating with demonic seductresses. True stories about real-life succubi experiences have become much more common in recent years. There are numerous posts on Reddit and other websites detailing both erotic and frightening encounters with real succubi. These posts have become so common that it is well worth the effort to explore the historical background of the succubus, as well as learn about succubus experiences in the present day. A medieval chronicler recorded a true story concerning a young man who became involved with a succubus and who later became Pope, Pope Sylvester II. When this Pope was a young student, he was called Gerbert of Aureliac he fell in love with the beautiful daughter of a university dean. She considered him too far beneath her social status and rejected him. Filled with passion and angst for the woman who turned him down, Gerbert became obsessed with thoughts of lust and sex, and it was then that he met a strange but beautiful young woman who seemed to appear out of nowhere. Her name was Meridiana, and she was quite keen to offer him all sorts of sexual contact esoteric knowledge, and even promised to make him rich. All of these stunning offers held one condition. He must remain faithful to her alone. Naturally, being a young, horny guy, Gerbert readily complied. He was steadfast to Meridiana, and as their relationship continued, his prospects increased very quickly. In no time, he was appointed Archbishop to Rhymes, a position far above that of the snobby university dean's daughter. Eventually, he became pope. Now, it is of course well known that Catholic clergy were charged with maintaining chastity, so Gerbert had to keep Meridiana a closely guarded secret, and she maintained her loyalty as well, encouraging and creating his successes, and even once forgave him for cheating on her when he became drunk and cheated with the dean's daughter. Apparently, she did not fully forgive him, though, because she later made the prediction that he would die soon on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem while he was celebrating Mass. Gerbert was terrified and immediately arranged a public confession of his lifetime of sexual sins. Had he not confessed and repented, he believed he surely would have died and gone straight to hell. While he immediately canceled his planned trip to Jerusalem, he later died in Rome where it's said that his tomb now appears covered in sweat just before the death of a pope. Over the centuries, some believed that a life of prayer and religious devotion provided protection from all evil spirits, including succubi. However, such piety rarely seemed to help. In fact, in some cases, succubi appeared to be especially attracted to the devout. The 19th century French author J. K. Heismans became the victim of a succubus while he was sleeping in a monastery. Heisman was actually on a pilgrimage of sorts. He had spent years of his life engaged in an exploration of the paranormal, and now his pilgrimage was intended to help him return to the Christian faith of his childhood. While his intentions were earnest, perhaps he was still subconsciously attracting the wrong sort of spiritual attention. One night, while he slept in the monastic cell, he awoke suddenly in the middle of sexual climax and just glimpsed a succubus as she was vanishing. 
He was convinced it was no dream since the bed he slept in held evidence of another form that had lain beside him while he slept. There was belief at the time that such incidents took place when succubi sought semen from victims, then changed into incubi, male sexual demons, and used it to impregnate their female victims. When Ethan arrived home late one evening in December of 2012, the Bakersfield, California youth was beyond exhausted. He had spent a very long day studying and listening to lectures at school. As soon as he arrived home, he collapsed into bed, desiring sleep over all else. And yet, he slept fitfully, with thoughts of dread and worry that someone or something was breaking into his home and approaching his bedroom door. Suddenly, whatever it was broke through his door, startling him from sleep. The invading entity flew to the wall behind Ethan's bed and held his limbs down firmly. His ears began to vibrate, even to the point of pain. The young man cried out for help, cursing whatever was restraining him. But the entity only laughed at him in a frightening voice. Suddenly, the entity, which later Ethan determined to have been a succubus, cried out, Soon! and let go of the terrified young man. Heart pounding, Ethan dashed to turn on the lights, but nothing appeared amiss. Only his dogs seemed to understand that something dangerously evil had entered the home. They barked and scratched at the door, worried about what was happening to their owner. Ethan then wandered into the bathroom to have a look in the mirror. He was shocked to see that his eyes were completely bloodshot and red. A young man named Patrick reported that in 2012, he was the unwitting victim of a succubus that took the form of an imaginary friend he had in childhood. The imaginary friend was called Lucy, and she would come and play with Patrick when he was alone or lonely. Lucy watched the boy grow and told him that one day, when he reached puberty, she would teach him some new, interesting, and exciting things, things he hadn't even imagined. Patrick's parents were so concerned about his imaginary friend, they sent him to a number of psychologists, trying to learn why he was becoming obsessed with a fictional, invisible character, but nothing helped. Then, when Patrick turned 16, he says Lucy began encouraging him to meet and date real women. She remained nearby to help him and teach him how to make himself and his partners sexually satisfied and so began Patrick's sexual relationship with Lucy, the succubus. He claims Lucy stuck around for years, continuing to have a variety of sensual and sexual experiences with her victim. Then Patrick met and fell in love with a real woman. They married, and at that point he began to see Lucy less and less. Then one day she was gone. After some years had passed, Patrick began to have trouble with his marriage, He began to feel Lucy returning at that point, but he has never revealed if he resumed the relationship with her or remained with his wife. Lilith is an ancient yet still thriving archetype of a fallen woman. She takes many forms. Perhaps the most famous is Lilith, the biblical Adam's first wife, although that's not in the Bible. Things didn't work out, apparently, and she left him. Over the ensuing centuries of Judeo-Christian culture, Lilith evolved as the ultimate symbol for succubi. Men across cultures and ages claim to have been visited by Lilith in the form of a succubus. Sometimes she is invoked or invited. Other times she sneaks in to unsuspecting males and takes what she wants from them. Some men are not only willing victims of a succubus, they actually research, plan, and summon the female sex demons. An anonymous online poster claims that he prayed to Lilith to send a succubus to him, and soon that is what happened. He described her as slender, tall, with fair skin and flaming long red hair. He called her Alira, and she stayed with the man for a number of days and nights. The sex, he stated, was incomparable to any he had experienced before, and Alira was positively insatiable. He was in heaven and could not believe his good fortune, singing praises to Lilith for helping him. But after a while, an evil presence also entered the man's life, pushing Alira out. How he interacted with her changed as well. Sometimes he could only see her in his head, 
or hear her in his mind. Other times, he would be out and about in public and suddenly she would appear to him, touching him in intimate ways, exciting him and simultaneously embarrassing him as others were around and watching. Perhaps that sort of activity was under the control of the more malevolent force. A former stripper named Contessa Adams claims to have been repeatedly attacked by a succubus. According to Adams, the succubus was attempting to transform her into a lesbian and also a devil worshiper. She said that when she was a stripper, evil entities were drawn to her and she was once possessed by sexual demons. Further, she cautioned others that anybody that's been attacked by them will tell you they're worried that they could not find that pleasure with mortal people. Another anonymous internet poster was eager to tell of his own personal succubus experience. He was diagnosed bipolar and was in the midst of his first manic episode when he first encountered the succubus. Though he was raised a Christian, he was also just overcoming an addiction to pornography. In other words, the timing and circumstances were ripe for a visit from a succubus. He says the experience began with the sensation of a gentle yet profoundly deep touch to his hand, which spread like a warmth over his entire body. At this point, he was fully conscious but wondered what was going on. He claims he could not see the succubus, but sensed her speaking to him as well as touching him. She asked him to go to a private place in his home. He wound up in his car, and that is when the succubus went into action. Over the next few minutes, he began to see her form and her eyes, both of which were beautiful, yet he could not see her breasts or genitals, even though he had contact with both. He claimed one of the most amazing parts of his experience was the perfume she exuded. It was intoxicating. She continued to morph throughout the time he shared with her, transforming her hair color, her eyes, her body, even her ethnicity. I felt as though we were in the Garden of Eden, making love for the first time in all creation, he wrote. Some experts argue that what humans perceive as an experience with a sexual demon is actually part of sleep paralysis. The inability to move and the sensation of being touched often do go hand in hand. However, more and more people are claiming that their experiences with succubi and or incubi are real. One man writing about his experience even mentions the feeling of paralysis all over his body. He attributes it to the succubus that was hovering over him. She began kissing and fondling him. He wrote that while he definitely enjoyed what she was doing, he remained terrified at the same time. He was completely in her grip and could not move. Their sexual encounter continued and he became wrapped with ecstasies he had never imagined. When it was over, she continued to hover over him, smiling. She asked him if he knew what succubi do and what they are for. Before he could reply, her face turned demonic red and her beautiful teeth became fangs. She laughingly told him that succubi take the souls of their victims and that he would be dead within three days. Then she disappeared. Apparently, the man survived at least long enough to write of his encounter and post it online. Succubi don't care who they hurt or who sees them doing their work. A case in point, a young woman named Veronica and her husband had a strange and violent encounter with a succubus that invaded their bedroom. The two were fast asleep one night when Veronica suddenly awakened and saw her husband being raped by a beautiful blonde woman with strange, shining eyes and pale skin. It had to be rape, she claimed, because her husband was just lying there, like nothing was happening. The succubus saw Veronica watching, snarled, reached over and slapped Veronica in the face so hard that the impact tossed her from the bed. Once she stood up and looked around, the woman had left. She then woke up her husband, who had no memory of what had just taken place. But there was evidence that something strange had happened. Veronica had a busted lip and was bleeding from where the succubus had scratched her. A small piece of what looked like a medallion was embedded in her husband's skin. The couple called the police, but they didn't believe their story. It took three weeks for Veronica's injuries to heal. A purportedly true 16th-century succubus encounter was recorded by author Nicholas Ramey. 
Apparently, a shepherd was hauled into court, tried, and convicted of witchcraft. When asked how he came to associate with witches, the young man claimed that some time before he had been seduced by a succubus and she had most thoroughly corrupted him. The shepherd went on to say that at some time after his first encounter with the succubus, he fell in love with a milkmaid. He felt so tenderly toward her, but she wanted nothing to do with him. Her rejection sent him into despair, and his thoughts turned towards the sexual. Essentially, he was horny and could not obtain the object of his desire. One day, he thought he saw his beloved milkmaid hiding behind a shrub. He was by her side in an instant and began roughly kissing and fondling her. Frightened, she pushed him away, then suddenly became extremely receptive to his advances. Encouraged, the shepherd continued, and the milkmaid made him promise to acknowledge her as his mistress and behave to her as though she were God himself. And this is what led to his downfall and eventual conviction of witchcraft. But what about your wife or your girlfriend? How can you tell if she is a succubus? As we've already discovered, succubi are sex demons who traditionally appear to men during the night in the form of a beautiful female form to steal men's souls with the help of sex energy. And also, as we've learned, these experiences are real, sometimes long-lasting as a twisted lover's relationship, and the encounters are not as harrowing as you would think, at least not in the beginning, until the man's soul is dragged down to hell, of course. Real succubus encounters involve a sexy demon creature that latches onto you and pulls out your essence, one late-night encounter at a time. If this sounds like someone in your life, then you or that person you are thinking of might be unwittingly in a relationship with a succubus, and if you're not careful, you can end up as a withered husk of a human with no soul. If you're wondering whether or not you're dealing with a real-life succubus, all you have to do is check out these helpful tips to determine if your girlfriend, wife, or significant other is secretly a sex demon stealing your soul. If the possibility of dating a scary monster like a vampire or succubus is high on your list of fears, then you should know what's out there. Maybe over the course of learning about succubi, you'll decide that a series of late-night spooky demonic sex encounters isn't really all it's cracked up to be. First, she doesn't have any family. This could either be good or bad, depending on how you feel about dating someone with zero connections to the human realm. Succubi aren't born of human flesh, so they have no parents, cousins, brothers, sisters, you get the idea. Plus, they are demons, so they really only respect the demonic hierarchy, which you aren't part of. If this kind of relationship works for you, keep in mind that when things end you will be left without a soul, then you fit the jackpot. But if you prefer to be in a relationship with someone who is tied to the moral and mortal coil, then you should cut things off before they become too intense. Your friends hate your significant other, but they don't know why. Everyone has been in a relationship where their friends don't like their significant other, but when you're with a secret sex demon who wants to steal your soul via intercourse, this kind of friction will be ratcheted up to the nth degree. You may think that your girlfriend slash wife slash whatevs is the sweetest flower that ever blossomed, but if your friends are constantly warning you about how they've got a bad feeling about her, or they simply recoil whenever she suddenly shows up on poker night, you might be dealing with an ageless succubus from another realm. Do you feel like someone's watching you when you're alone? Specifically, do you feel like your girlfriend or wife is watching you when she's not even in the room? And not just in the way that she's set up a complicated video system to watch you while you're alone doing whatever it is you do on your computer but in a way that the air seems dense with her presence, despite her not actually being there. 
This could be a sign that your significant other is a succubus who's watching you even when you're all by your lonesome. And that's a lot creepier than just breaking into your email. Does your significant other's voice rattle through your head? Quick question. When you're walking home from work or school, does the voice of your girlfriend bounce around in your head like a racquetball? Are you finding that your thoughts are no longer your own? When a succubi's hold over you begins to increase, you'll hear her voice in your head, constantly telling you to do things and act certain ways. If you're at this point in your relationship with a succubus, it may be too late to separate yourself, but you need to try and end it immediately. Get help from a pastor if you need it. Have you stopped hanging out with your friends? In the early stages of dating a succubus, you may find yourself being drawn further into your relationship, ghosting all of your friends without even knowing it. If you wake up one morning and realize that you haven't seen your friends in weeks, you may be coming out of a succubus haze, and that could be a sign that your life force is being slowly drained by a sex demon. But before you immediately call out your significant other for being a demonic spirit set on eating your soul, make sure that she ticks off a few of the other boxes on this list first. You may just be in a codependent relationship, which is fine if you like hanging out with your significant other all day. You lucky duck. You feel drained after having sex with your significant other. And not just in the way when you're like, wow, I need some water, but in a way where it seems like you are wasting away and that a portion of whatever soul you have left is gone. Take note the next time you have sex with your significant other, who may or may not be a succubus, are they also super tired or do they seem like they are more charged than ever afterwards? If the latter is the case, then they may be stealing your soul while you're in bed together. She can feel your emotions. So here's the thing about succubi. They are incredibly tuned in to emotions of others and they kind of have to be in order to make the sexual dreams of their lovers come true while slowly stealing their soul. If you feel like your significant other always knows exactly how you're feeling and maybe even uses it against you, there's a good chance that you have a succubus on your hands. You can't stop thinking about sex when they're around. Succubi are literally sex demons so it's not like you should be surprised by the fact that whenever you see your significant other, your brain immediately turns to mush and goes straight for the feel-good tingles. This kind of thing can be detrimental if they use their sex powers to make you screw up stuff at work and elsewhere in your life. Were you sexually repressed before you met her? If you were a total square who was uptight before meeting your girlfriend, but now you're into all kinds of super cool poly stuff, you might be in a relationship with a succubus. These sex demons use their sexy powers to pull men out of their comfort zones so they more freely give up that sweet, sweet soul during intercourse. Before you accuse your spouse, though, of being a succubus, ask yourself if she's really stealing your soul or if she's just trying to get you to have fun outside of societal norms. If that's the case, then relax and go with the flow. She only comes around at night. Have you been in a long-term, super-intense sexual relationship with someone who only visits you at night after you've gone to bed? Maybe she appears to you as you're drifting off, or her body suddenly appears out of the shadows. Either way, this is a pretty accurate way to decipher whether or not you're seeing a succubus. However, before you try to break up with your succubus, you should probably make sure she doesn't have an intense day job that makes it so she's only available in the nighttime hours. Normal girls do work third shift sometimes, you know. All of this said, you don't have to be dating a succubus to end up a withered husk of a man with no soul. You might just be dating a psychopath. But that is a topic for another day. Coming up next on Weird Darkness, many towns have tales of an old woman who might be a witch of some kind. 
Warrington, England had its own local evil crone. She was known as Old Peggy Gronich and was described as being evil, ugly, and haggard. But was she truly a witch? Many people thought so. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. Warrington is a picturesque town located in the north of England and is dominated by the expansive River Mercy. Its origins date back millennia, specifically to the Roman invasion of England which began in 43 AD. Just like so many old English towns and villages, Warrington has its very own saga of the supernatural kind attached to it. It is a story that goes back to the 1600s, and revolves around the malignant machinations of a local evil crone. She was known by the people of the area as Old Peggy Gronich and was described as being evil, ugly, and haggard. The tale is a strange one. It was carefully and independently investigated and chronicled by two English researchers of the paranormal, Neil Arnold and the late Wally Barnes, the former in an article titled The Warrington Man-Beast, and the latter in a 1990 book titled Ghosts, Mysteries, and Legends of Old Warrington. So the old tale goes, much feared Peggy had for years managed to successfully stay one step ahead of the many witch-hunting gangs that roamed the countryside, and who were determined to see all of England's witches roasted to death on flaming bonfires. Whether due to good luck or the effects of some dark and disturbing incantation, Peggy was clearly not meant to have a fiery end. She successfully went from hamlet to hamlet and from town to town, and carefully ensured that she never, ever stayed in one place for too long. And that included Warrington, too, which she chose to call her next home after skillfully eluding hunters from the eastern England city of Norwich. Although the witch hunters failed to catch up with Peggy, her reputation most assuredly preceded her, to the effect that when word got out that she was on the way, a chilled and ominous atmosphere quickly descended upon Warrington and its worried people. It was an atmosphere which remained for months, to the regret of just about everyone. Due to the fact that back in the 1600s, it took weeks, sometimes months even, for news to travel the length and the breadth of the country, Peggy knew that she was safe for at least a while. 
As a result, she quickly put down roots at what became known locally as Peggy Gronich's Chicken Farm. It was a ruined, spooky old building that no one wished to visit. Not even the local and usually adventurous children of the town. At least, that is, not for a couple of weeks. The day came, however, when that spirit of youthful excitement got the better of a group of young kids, who decided to check out the old farm for themselves. It was something that one and all bitterly came to regret, and quickly so, too. As they stealthily crept through the wild, tall grass that surrounds an old and battered cottage that stood next to the farm, a terrible and fierce face appeared at one of the windows. The children were momentarily frozen by the sight of a creature that, with a degree of hindsight, sounds like some unholy combination of a Bigfoot and a demon. It was a hair-covered humanoid that sported blazing red eyes and two huge horns which sat on top of its large, bulbous head. Suddenly, the slavering monster was gone, and old Peggy came screeching through the front door, running wildly in the direction of the hysterical children. When the kids told their parents of the terrible thing that they had just encountered, in no time rumors got around that the horned, hairy thing and Peggy Gronich were one and the same, a witch that understood and employed the mysterious secrets of shapeshifting, and in terrible fashion. Others believed that the beast was Gronich's familiar, a familiar being a supernatural entity such as an imp or a demon that could take on the form of numerous animals, such as cats, toads, rats, and monstrous things. No one dared go anywhere near the old farm, lest they become the next victim of Peggy or her familiar. Thankfully, things quieted down for a couple of weeks. That is, until a local man pulling his horse and cart was attacked by what sounded very much like the same hideous beast. Luckily, no harm came to the man nor his horse, and both managed to flee the area while never looking back. Only days later, however, there was yet another supernatural assault. On this occasion, the outcome was very different. A local farmer found one of his cows savagely mutilated and killed by violent decapitation. A group of locals, no doubt waving flaming torches and provoking, for us, imagery of those old black-and-white Frankenstein movies of the 30s and 40s, headed off to the farm. It was time to bring Peggy Gronich's reign of terror to an irreversible halt. Perhaps anticipating that she had outstayed her welcome, Peggy was nowhere in sight. The only telltale sign of her dark presence was the bloodied and half-eaten body of a dead goat. Although that was the end of the story, and Peggy was never seen again, years later rumors swirled around Warrington to the effect that the skeleton of a strange creature had been found, semi-buried in an old nearby field. It was said to have had the body of a large, four-legged animal and the skull of a human. Old, wizened Peggy struck down halfway through her terrible transformation from woman to monster, perhaps? That's exactly what many of the townsfolk of Warrington thought. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Real Life Encounters with Shadow People was written by Audrey Webster. The Strange Tale of an English Witch is by Nick Redfern. The Deadly Allure of the Succubus is by Cheryl Adams Richkoff. And Is My Girlfriend a Sex Demon was written by Jacob Shelton. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 3, verse 34. He mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. And a final thought, no one is perfect. Mistakes at all stages are made, but one who rises after every fall is a person who knows how to fight. Preeti Batra
I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.